Just like a rock star, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky is on a tour of Europe, and he is receiving a reception that a rock star could only dream of. After a surprise visit to London, Zelensky met with his German and French counterparts in Paris before addressing the European Union in Brussels. All with one goal, to get more military aid from his allies. With the one-year anniversary of the war approaching, reports have suggested that Russia is planning its largest offensive to date. But with his Western allies supporting Ukraine throughout a tough winter, is Zelensky being greedy now? Is the support from the West going to help them defeat Russia or just stay afloat? With sanctions not having the desired effect on the Russian economy, is the isolationist us versus them policy from the West going to have any impact? How successful will Zelensky's European tour be? So let's get to it. How successful will the Zelensky Euro trip uh, uh, be? Uh, as always, we begin with our quick fire round, 30 seconds each to let your initial stance, and now we pick it up uh, from there. So, Ina, please take the lead. Your 30 seconds are on. Well, I do believe that the fact that the visits are taking place are, and, and that they are met with, with so many people and, and we are seeing the rounds of ovations uh, for, for the president and for the whole nation of Ukraine, that of course gives us hope that what we're asking for, and, and it's just pretty simple, we're asking to help us liberate our own territory, that we would actually be able to achieve what we're asking for, because those are legitimate uh, things that any other nation in the world would also be asking for. Peter, your thoughts? Well, Zelensky has always has staking out uh, a very maximalist position. He is there to ask for artillery guns, for ammunition, modern tanks, uh, and a, speed, a much speedier delivery than has been promised so far, uh, fighter jets, etc. knowing full well that we probably won't get all of it and we won't get the, it in time. But I think time is of the essence, and this is what Zelensky is trying to communicate. Russia is uh, going to be on the offensive pretty time soon. It's a pretty much done deal, and so uh, Europeans need to get their act together and try to get as much uh, as they can, as fast as they can. And I think this is, uh, you know, this is uh, his goal and I hope he uh, achieves it. Yeah, last but not least, uh, Nick, your take? <clears throat> yeah, I believe for Zelensky it's great. Is a kind of movie star, TV star, great start, everybody applauding to him and welcoming him. So for his own fame, it's great. It's also great for a PR of those countries and maybe for the social media and for mass media, especially in the West, it's great. But will it help the Ukrainian people? I don't think so. But no, man, no matter how many weapons they will get, it will not help them because the uh, country will continue to be destroyed. They just need to reach a peace agreement. Okay, and on that note, uh, let's uh, please feel free uh, to respectfully interact, uh, of course, and let's begin from the point uh, Nick was just uh, uh, making. Will, will, will Western weapons really make a change on the ground or, or will it just, you know, drag the war even uh, uh, further, uh, Peter? Well, this is, uh, you know, we have to be very mindful of repeating uh, Putin's, uh, you know, uh, propaganda uh, and disinformation tricks. This is the message he's trying to now uh, spread that, you know, no, you know, you're just prolonging this war by giving Ukraine weapons. Let me remind everyone that despite the Ukrainian grit and determination to, re you know, defend their country, unless we had been given javelins, I had been, unless we had been given early in the war, Baryakar, Turkish-made drones, we would not be here, I would not be here sitting in Kiev yeah. with you most likely. So Western provided weaponry does help, and so we have to separate the truth from Kremlin spread lies. What uh, Price, what price, at what price are we talking about peace with Russians now? Yes, wars do end at the negotiating table, but we're not there yet. We have to be in a better position territorially in order and, 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 and uh, you know, in order to negotiate with Russia. Right now, this peace is simply untenable. And Nick Macron, French President Macron, and German Chancellor Olaf Scholz, with a very, of course, warm welcome of uh, Ukrainian uh, President Zelensky, saying the future of Europe as a whole, uh, uh, depends on the future of, of Ukraine. Is that so? 
I think that uh, what do you uh, refer to as the future of Europe? If it's just a geopolitical game and a game of economy, so yes, maybe it's better for them that Russia and Ukraine will continue their war and uh, Russia will be weakened. Europe maybe will be stronger, but most likely United States will be stronger. But just Europe can't resist United States. But uh, that's the only perspective that it is uh, good for Europe. But for Ukraine, it's definitely bad. And for Ukrainian simple people that living in those small villages that are bombarded every day, it's not good for sure. And for Russian people, the regular ones, it's also not good because they are living under sanctions. Their life is completely messed up also. So it's yeah. also not good for them. Ina, do you get what, what Nick is saying, that uh, uh, the war is perhaps, quote unquote, good for Europe, but, but not for Ukraine? Well, it definitely is not good for Ukraine. And no, if for anything, sure. yeah. ask, ask, do I want peace? Yes, very much so, because my son goes to the bomb shelter every time there is an air raid alert in Kiev. I wake up every single morning texting my, my, my partner, asking if he's alive because he's at the battlefront. That is the price that we are all paying. This has been like this for, for one year for us, the whole year of this hell that we're living through. But it's absolutely wrong to blame the victim. It's like saying that the, the rape victim doesn't enjoy what is happening to her, so she just needs to make a peace with the person who is raping her. That is not how it works. Not a single person on the whole planet Earth can guarantee that whatever peace is made with Putin at this point, that Putin will actually do whatever agreement is reached. Not a single person, not in the studio, not on the whole planet, because Putin is out of control. And and no matter how much I wanted for peace to be established, trust mm. me, I want it with a whole my heart. But there is no way for it to be established, particularly not through some false negotiations. And there is another thing to add, that you remember that uh, almost, well, oh, a bit less than a year ago, but soon it's going to be a year, everybody was saying Ukraine is going to fall in three days. Yeah. Putin's uh, military we will be in Kiev in the city center in, in three days after invasion. We are standing. We liberated huge portions of the territory that Russians have got under their control. And we have been quite successful about that. And Ukrainian army proved to be much stronger than the Russian army. So I really hope that the spread of, of Russian propaganda, I agree with Peter here, will actually stop. Because Ukraine is quite successful in defending our land and in defending the, the eastern front of Europe altogether from this Russian barbaric invasion. But Ina, Peter, uh, for Ukraine, the end goal is Crimea. Uh, is it the, the West's end goal too? Well, uh, yes, that's a big question. You know, uh, Ukraine has uh, staked out maximalist goals, and that is the, you know, reconquering its territory, liberating its territory uh, up to the 1991 borders, including Crimea. Uh, uh, I would not be uh, honest if I told you that everyone is on board with this, even though uh, the U.S. continues and, and, and other uh, European uh, Western allies of Ukraine continue to insist that it's up to Ukraine to determine when and where they will stop territorially speaking uh but uh, i am afraid that the west is very concerned with just putting the so-called red lines and the crimea is obviously vladimir putin's red line the west is still cognizant of it and is wary that uh um you know, this is uh, you know liberating crimea is when russia's uh, nuclear doctrine kicks in and that is that means using nuclear weapons uh, in order uh, yeah. to deter further encroachment upon its territory. So this is where we are at and remains a big question whether Ukraine will liberate Ukraine militarily or whether through a combination, uh, military and political, uh, one particular area um, uh, that will be, uh, that we will have to watch will be the so-called land yeah. corridor leading to the Crimea and connecting Crimea to, uh, mm -hmm. to the rest of Russia. This is where we can expect a uh, Ukrainian counterattack at some point, um, leading, uh, to the summer, which would make the, you know, yes. Russia's continuing occupation of Crimea, uh, untenable should Ukraine break through this land corridor. Nick, Ina, please chime in. Uh, uh, I think, okay, if I'm speaking, I think that uh, for uh, Ukrainian politicians, for the president, for some uh, 
rich billionaires maybe this war is really good because they are getting more popular and more uh, have more fame more power more money yeah for them it's great but as long as i know the regular people in ukraine they even can't speak because if they are saying something that it's not in line with what the government wants you to say then they even can be prosecuted or they can be jailed at least that's what i know that's the information that i have maybe it's wrong but if it's really the situation it's really bad because you can't say that all ukraine is one victim like the speaker before said it's 40 yes, yes, something Ina, million so, people so. yeah yeah uh, uh, no. but don't Ina, please. under terrible conditions under airstrikes every single day you are saying that they want this to continue no they don't want this to continue they want it to stop but they cannot allow for, for this uh, to be stopped what you are arguing for. Also claiming that uh, not a single politician can, can speak their mind. I'm representing here the opposition political party. I'm free to speak my mind. I'm free to do that in, in, in Ukrainian television as well. I can do this. So please stop spreading this Putin's propaganda again. And again, whatever happens in Ukraine, not a single thing that you said is an excuse for what Putin is doing to all of us for almost a year, very, very intensely, and for nine years, if you, if you remember that the war started in 2014. And if I may, I will get back to, to this Crimea issue, because I do think that this is an important one to discuss. And I will agree with Peter here that, indeed, it's, it's a complicated thing, uh, because taking back Crimea militarily might be extremely complicated, and we might need to be searching for some sort of political solution. Let there be a regime change in Russia, and, and then we can negotiate the, the return of Crimea back to Ukraine. But why is that so critically important? Well, first of all, because more than 80% of Ukrainians believe that is important. So 80% is, is the absolute yeah. majority of Ukrainians who believe that to be important. Okay. Crimea is the native land for Crimean Tatars. They don't have any other land that they will call, the, call their own home. And that's where Russians are destroying them. They have arranged for a genocide of Crimean Tatars there in 1944. That is what Crimean Tatars remember, and that is what they're continuing to do right yeah. now. And I think for Israel, understanding not having any other land to call home is critically important. That is why it is so important to have Crimea back to Ukraine. But okay. secondly, because Crimea being used by Russia as a military base to invade the rest of Ukraine. So from strategic military point of view, yeah. if Russia controls Ukraine, we would always be not safe. Okay, Peter, in the really uh, 20 seconds we have left before we uh, conclude the first part of our discussion, your concluding remark? Yeah, let me just say uh, my concluding remark would be in response to our Israeli co-panelists. I'm very surprised that you had mentioned uh, the sort of, uh, you know, discrimination, the sort of repression against uh, voices of, uh, you know, uh, dissent in Ukraine, where I do not know of a single case, and in fact, it is Russia, which uh, now has uh, a law that makes any sort of criticism yeah. of the Russian army's actions in Ukraine punishable by 15 years okay. in jail. So we're definitely not, you know, uh, okay. criticizing uh, the, the, the right Peter Zelmayev, Nikol Yochin, and uh, Ina Sovson, we're uh, putting a quick stop right here, but we're back in a few minutes with part two of our debate. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back uh, to the summit. Uh, still with us, uh, Peter Zolmaya, Vina Sufsen, and uh, Nika Kolyokhin. Thank you all so very much uh, for staying with us. We're also, of course, staying on topic. But before we get back to our conversation, let's take a listen uh, to one of uh, many speeches uh, by the Ukrainian uh, president this week, this time uh, with a uh, British uh, lawmaker saying thanks, but we need more. Let's take a listen. We have freedom. Give us wings to protect it. I trust, I trust this symbol will help us for our next coalition, coalition of the planes, and I appeal to you and the world with simple and yet most important words, combat aircrafts for Ukraine, wings for freedom. So let's uh, get to it uh, with uh, quite an upfront uh, a phrasing here. Will it ever be enough for Ukraine? Uh, are they being a bit greedy? Uh, let's begin uh, with another quick fair round and pick up the conversation uh, uh, from there. Peter Zolmayev, please take the lead. 
Well, obviously, they're not being greedy. Ukrainian is giving, uh, uh, you know, is making a great deal for Europeans. It will fight, it will spend its own blood. All the Europeans need to do is give Ukraine some uh, weaponry. And obviously, we're not being greedy. Once again, you know, Ukraine uses, goes through every day through as much artillery yes. rounds as, as, as uh, uh, you know, a normal European country goes through in a year. You know, Russia has thrown everything it can, it has at us, all this muni on the munitions, millions of guns uh, and thousands of things that it has accumulated over the uh, decades. And so this is, once again, don't forget, this is Europe's yes. largest land-based war since World War II. This is paying, paying with blood, no other way to put it. Uh, Nick, uh, your 30 seconds are on. I think it's a great input to the world the industry of the war of weapons, especially for the American uh, companies that are doing a, a great profit from that. So maybe for them it's great. But for Ukraine, as I said before, I don't think they can have okay. enough weapons if they are against a superpower that have nuclear weapons and have enough weapons to destroy them and the world actually also. So what's the point? Ina, what's the point Nick is asking? I'm sure you, you have an answer. Well, the point, Nick, is to protect the basic values that we all share dear. And that is why Ukraine is calling for the world to unite, just like Israel did when it was fighting for its own values, its, in its own survival. I'm having here the book, by, uh, the biography of Golda Meir, and I remember vividly reading how he traveled to the United States asking for weapons over there. Was that helping the American industrial military complex? Well, maybe. Is that not justified? Well, I do believe that that would be wrong to say. Um, and I, I do, uh, let's feel free to interact from this point onwards, of course. And I do want to circle back to what uh, Peter said uh, uh, before we uh, took a break uh, during his opening remarks, suggesting that uh, uh, perhaps, if, if I understood correctly, um, there is a negotiation tactic of sort, as in that President Zelensky is, is setting a, a very high bar that, that, that uh, will allow a leeway to, to get something more modest, but that will still satisfy the Ukrainian uh, uh, need. I I Ina, is that so? Do, do you see it that way? Well, the truth is that, of course, we are fighting against the second biggest army in the world, and, and it is uh, very difficult to fight against such an army. But also remember this, this army is recognized as the, uh, this country, Russia, is recognized as the biggest threat to NATO security. Yeah. And we are doing the fighting basically on behalf of NATO, even though we are not NATO members. So, so yes, it is a huge power. And not show me a single country on earth, except probably for the United States, who would be able to withstand the pressure of such a big army. But we did that. And we did that successfully with our army and with our people who are, or everybody is getting ready to fight. Who Look yeah. at the lines with people who are yeah. still volunteering to go to the army to fight for what they believe to be important. They're not doing that to make somebody rich. They're doing that because somebody came to their house yeah. and violated it. And that is not right. And I'm sorry, but, but protecting this sort of logic is, is just flawed. It's just, it's just wrong on so many levels. Peter, please. Yeah, it's very simple. It comes down to this. Uh, if Ukraine stops the fight, and when we're hearing from our co-panelists and other assorted experts who say, let's just stop this war, let's just stop this nonsense, it only escalates. If Ukraine stops firing, it will cease to exist as an independent country. Let's make let no, let that make no uh, yeah, other. Yeah, and that by the way Russia, corresponds directly with the Gorda Mayer's uh, famous quote uh, exactly. you know, I just mentioned. If, yeah. if, if Russia stops to fire, the war will be over. That's it. And so, once again, we, we know what, what Ukraine has done is demonstrated to the world that there's no need to fear the world's second largest army. The fear has been conquered. If we don't go ahead with this, if, we don't, if we're not consistent, if we don't see this through and see Russia be defeated, it will create a very dangerous precedent. And Joe Biden, in his State of the Union address, said that much. It will impact directly on Western and U.S. interests. It will allow... Uh, you know, China uh, to go against Taiwan, and the yes. U.S. has but, a, but a in, treaty agreement in, with Taiwan. So this this precedent will be dangerous for all of us. But Peter, in, in this respect, will will dragging on the war mean empowering the anti-Western uh, alliance greater scheme of things here? And, and do you see any prospects of Russia still winning the war? You know, it ain't over till it's over. 
Well, I mean, I do see prospects of Russia dragging it on unless West steps up its game and uh, gives Ukraine all it needs uh, to create a new reality on the ground. Russia keeps talking about a new reality on the ground what that we need to recognize. Yes, wars end at the negotiating table. But the reason I said we're not there yet is because we have not, you know, established the kinds of conditions on the ground that would not allow Putin uh, to declare victory and thereby create this dangerous precedent I spoke of. Nick, is there a solution that, that can satisfy both sides? I think that the only solution is that both sides will sit and will speak and will agree on a peace uh, deal. I th said from the beginning it was a big mistake of Russia to invade to Ukraine. I'm against this war. I'm against any war. But you, I don't think that Ukrainian people, the simple one, that their homes are bombarded and their relatives are dying, I don't think that they want to be the front of NATO and to defend all Europe and United States. I don't think... From my perspective and my understanding, this is the dream of the mothers of Ukraine that their children will defend the children of American mothers or of European mothers that they are continue to have a great life in their countries. I don't think that that's the case. Maybe for some politicians in Ukraine it's great, as I said, but I don't think for regular people it's good. Uh, uh, you know, we are nearing uh, the one year anniversary. Um, is Russia planning a major offensive? Are there any rabbits left to, to, to pull from Moscow's standpoint? Uh, I'll just, uh, I will answer Please. that, but I will uh, refer short to the uh, comment made by Nick. Well, thank you very much for speaking on behalf of Ukrainian people, but I will be doing that part of the job in this conversation, if you don't mind, as a Ukrainian politician and as a representative of Ukrainian people, and as the person whose husband is f f fighting in the war from the day one of this big invasion. I don't want him to fight, but he doesn't have a choice, because otherwise, Putin's military guys will be here in Kyiv, and that is what I don't want. And that is what not a single person in Kyiv wants to have here. And again, what are you saying? Let's sit down and make a peace. Will you guarantee that Putin will hold his end of the deal, whatever that end will be? No, you will not. And if nobody can guarantee our security, we have to continue fighting for it ourselves. Will there be any further invasion? They will definitely try to. But we know that we are prepared. We are much better prepared than we were a year ago. I'm sure we would be able to withhold it. But of course, we want to minimize the number of, of, of uh, casualties on our side. And that is why we are calling for more weapons to be provided to Ukraine, not because we want to, to invade Russia, but because we want to protect our own people. That is the only thing that we are fighting. Uh, uh, Peter, really briefly in the time we have uh, left, uh, is there any guarantor to, to Russia's end of a deal? Uh, uh, I think the only, the, there are countries that can guarantee China is that country. China has already guaranteed so far uh, that Russia will not use a nuclear weapon. So our fears of Russia using nuclear weapons are overblown. Uh, China can step in. That's, the uh, I think, the only hope if we talk about a mediator. China can make this war end. And on that note, uh, we obviously have uh, so much more to discuss, but we will have uh, to end our current discussion uh, here. Ina Sovson, Peter Azomayev, and Nicole Jochen, thank you so very much uh, for your time and insight. Uh, we truly do appreciate it, and hopefully we will see you on the show again. Um, thank you very much for this.